welcome everybody. This is weird having a microphone in a room this small. Um, my name is uh, Kevin Field. I'm associate professor in nuclear engineering, and radiological sciences, or NERS. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, which is a joint MICD and NERS uh, a special seminar. Um, so Larry here is from Idaho National Laboratory and is one of the lead developers on Marmot and working on the Moose platforms, doing computational uh, materials, and also one of our illustrious alumni as well, and interacting with us. Um, in interacting with NERS and other um, staff here at University of Michigan, trying to build better collaborations between INL and UMich. Uh, so we're really happy to have him here and learn more about your research um, and talk about INL and um, keep on fostering these collaborations and research. So please go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the uh, introduction and the invitation. Uh, it's really great to be back, back on campus, see a lot of uh, familiar faces and friends. Um, so um, before I get into um, before I get into the technical part of my talk, I wanted to just uh, say a little bit about um, INL and, and who we are and what we do. So um, climate change obviously is, is a very pressing concern for our, our planet right now. And so many people, including myself, think that uh, nuclear energy should be an important part of a, an overall strategy to reduce carbon emissions. So um, you know, just as an example, uh, uh, Members of the Nuclear Energy Institute recently identified the need to add an additional 100 gigawatts of, of nuclear power generating capacity by 2050, which is more than, than doubling the current capacity. So um, at INL, we're, we're working to make uh, nuclear part of the, uh, the overall strategy to introduce uh, climate change. So um, our mission, I'll just read from the slide, is to um, discover, demonstrate, and secure innovative nuclear energy solutions, clean energy options, and critical infrastructure. So we do that through the work of, of uh, five directorates that are shown up here, um, uh, Nuclear Science and Technology, uh, where I work, um, the Advanced Test Reactor Complex and Materials and Fuels Complex. Those are um, facilities that are located um, out in the, the desert west of, uh, west of town, where a lot of the hands-on work in, in um, developing uh, new reactor types, testing reactor types, and testing materials and fuels for those reactors is done. Um, we also uh, have um, other related uh, uh, clean energy uh, projects in addition to nuclear. So those are uh, principally done in the uh, energy and environmental science and technology directorate, which uh, does things like looking at um, making uh, electric, uh, electric vehicles more efficient. And um, then finally, we have uh, the National and Homeland Security Directorate. And so they focus on um, infrastructure, so things like um, making a more uh, resilient new, uh, energy production grid, making a, a Wi-Fi network, uh, Wi-Fi and, and 5G communication networks be more resilient. So um, just wanted to show a few statistics to show uh, how that work kind of falls into um, all the work in those different mission areas kind of um, is broken up. So uh, by, uh, by budget, we're the fifth largest uh, Department of Energy National Lab. Um, annual budget is about uh, $1.6 billion. And we have, um, I think the total number of employees is actually closer to 6,000 now, up from about uh, 5,600 on this slide. So our work is, is uh, broken up, as you can see on this um, chart, uh, a little more than half uh, into energy-related projects, uh, most of the funding for which comes from the DOE Office of Nuclear Energy. We then have uh, about a third of our work is um, national security related, and then 16% uh, uh, various other uh, topics. So within our, our nuclear research portfolio, we're looking at both ways to uh, try to um, sustain the current um, existing fleet of commercial reactors, and, and also to um, expand on the, um, the development and licensing and deployment of, of new reactor types. So for for the existing reactor fleet, we're looking at things like um, how do we um, understand how, he, how human factors affect um, safety in existing plants, all the way to looking at things like how does the microstructure of nuclear fuels change as we get to high burn up and, and to try to help uh, licensing of current plants out to higher burn up limits. Then within um, advanced reactor technologies, we're looking at um, designs, um, fuels, materials, and, and licensing strategies to try to help um, bring new designs into the mix. So this uh, this chart just kind of shows some of the um, uh, advanced reactor uh, projects that are coming online within the next uh, six years or so. So these are all ones that INL are 
INL is involved with in, in some way, whether and whether it's cited at, at INL or not. So one of the things that's, uh, you know, this I think is a really exciting time to be involved in, in nuclear because of all these new types of, of um, designs that are coming online. Um, one thing that's that's uh, exciting but also challenging is that many of these um, reactor designs are very different from the uh, the the type of design that's used in commercial light water reactor plants that are that are prevalent today. So that means we don't have a lot of of data to draw from to um, to, to to you know inform design uh, of these models and also to to make a, a license licensing case to the NRC. So. Um, to kind of try to address that challenge, um, uh, many folks that are involved, uh, including INL, are, are relying more on modeling and simulation to try to um, help us um, get the data that we need in, uh, in a faster and cheaper way to, to, to develop new advanced reactor concepts. So uh, at INL, a lot of that work is done using a platform called MOOSE, which stands for Multi-Physics Object-Oriented Simulation Environment. So MOOSE is a, a general purpose open source framework uh, for solving partial differential equations. It's been open source for about uh, eight years now, nine years now. So MOOSE is prim primarily a finite element but, uh, based framework, although we do have some capabilities for, for finite volume techniques. And so we have a lot of nice features built in that, that um, folks can go and download uh, the, the framework today and take advantage of. So things like uh, fully implicit time stepping and automatic differentiation, a lot of flexibility around um, the type of mesh and the types of shape functions you want to use, and also a lot of nice features for um, running large uh, 3D simulations uh, right out of the box. So, so a lot of um, parallelization is already built in, mesh adaptivity, time step adaptivity, and the code is very uh, flexible to go from a 1D test that you might um, use to validate your model all the way up to a large 3D simulation. So I just wanted to give a little more uh, background on kind of how the code is structured and how all the different applications, um, if you're working in nuclear at all, you may have, have heard of some of these before, how they sort of fit into the general framework. So um, Moose itself is built on a couple of other software libraries. So we use, um, we use Petsy uh, as our primary uh, solver for nonlinear equations. Um, and then uh, a lot of the finite element underpinnings are handled by a library called LibMesh. Um, you know, that handles kind of this, the setup of, of the mesh shape functions, things like that. And then the physics are, are, are kind of implemented in, in, at the Moose level. And that, so that's basically where you implement the weak form of your partial differential equation. So then when you, uh, when you download Moose, if you download the open source uh, release, you get quite a few applications that have various types of physics already implemented as part of open source. So you know physics like um, solid mechanics, phase field, heat conduction, uh, Navier-Stokes equations for fluid flow and so on are, are included. Um, so that's uh, kind of one flavor of misapplication. Another flavor are these open source applications. So uh, Malmute is one that recently was released as open source. And so that's a library for um, advanced manufacturing techniques. Um, and then we have um, several, and then anything that's nuclear specific usually requires a license. So if you are interested in those tools, um, you know, a license generally is, is available from INL uh, and it doesn't cost anything, but it does require some, some administrative um, overhead to, to get access. Once you have access, you know, you have access to the source code, you can modify it, do what you do what you like with it, but it does take a, a bit more um, Anything nuclear specific um, takes a, a bit more time to get, get access. Um, so yeah, like I said, we're using computation to kind of try to accelerate moving towards um, advanced reactor development and deployment. So that's one strategy. Another strategy that we're trying to use to, to, to help us achieve our goals is <laughs> collaboration with, with other institutions, world-class institutions that have similar interests. So uh, University of Michigan, for example, um, so uh, this was, uh, we recently signed a memorandum of understanding between uh, the two institutions uh, earlier this year, and then we had a kind of a formal kickoff meeting uh, in May, and uh, you know, several, several folks that are here were involved with that. So the MOU is, is fairly broad and, and listed out quite a few topics of, of potential mutual interest, which I think many in the room are, are, are likely uh, interested in. 
Um, the MOU then uh, kind of leaves some flexibility for how in a con more concrete way we can work together. So, you know, some of the ideas that have been discussed and some of which that are already in progress are listed here, things like joint proposals, um, exchange and training visits. So we, we hosted uh, several faculty from uh, nuclear engineering and radiological sciences over the summer. So a photo from that is there. Um, we also recently conducted training on Moose for the nuclear engineering department. Um, we have some representation from INL in um, uh, senior design, uh, at least one senior de design project, um, internships, uh, re uh, recruiting of graduate students, joint appointments. These are all ideas that are in various stages of, of development and, and look forward to working with you all. As, as some of you know, I'm located here in Ann Arbor now. I'm working remotely for INL, so very happy to come to campus, interact with folks, and, and kind of try to continue to foster those collaborations. Okay, so um, now I'm kind of shifting to the technical part of the talk, and um, uh, a lot of the work that uh, has has uh, been done uh, by our group in the past is on um, multi-scale uh, simulation of nuclear fuel performance. So that is principally done at INL using a, a code called Bison. So that's where we're simulating a fuel element kind of at the engineering scale, the scale you can see and touch. Um, and so there are uh, historically uh, many different fuel performance codes out there, and, and usually they use some kind of empirical correlation to, um, uh, you know, for material parameters, things like thermal conductivity and things like that. Um, and so, you know, if you're looking at uh, the traditional UO2 uh, fueled reactor design, uh, that might be fine. But if you're interested in new types of, of reactors where that kind of data isn't available, then uh, the uh, we have to use a different approach. And so the approach that we've uh, been using a lot in the last few years has been a multi-scale modeling and simulation approach. So um, we informed Bison with, with atomistic and a combination of atomistic and mesoscale methods. Uh, so often we'll use the, uh, first principles techniques like density functional theory and molecular dynamics to calculate what's uh, parameters at the atomistic level. Sometimes things, sometimes those are passed directly to bison, but often we need to account for the microstructure of fuel. So uh, we use our um, mesoscale code uh, marmot, uh, which is basically uh, the moose phase field module with, with some additional um, uh, materials and physics that are necessary for, for um, uh, nuclear fuel performance. Um, and so then we develop some kind of a model um, that can be used. Sometimes it's a it's a single parameter. Sometimes it's a it's a model form that gets passed to Bison for use in engineering scale uh, field performance simulation. So I know many of you are not uh, nuclear engineers. So um, uh, before I talk uh, into a, in a little more detail, I wanted to give some very basic background on um, fuel elements. Um, so within a reactor, we have uh, a, a, a collection of fuel rods uh, cooled by water. Uh, each of these rods is basically a stack of, of pellets. Uh, the, the, main, the, the fuel used in commercial light water reactors these days is uranium dioxide. Um, and they're uh, encased in this cladding, which uh, is, is uh, an, a zirconium-based alloy. Um, and so <clears throat> one of the main performance considerations of these fuel elements is uh, fission gas release. So what that means is that um, fission... Uh, Fission, as fission occurs, we produce uh, insoluble gas atoms such as xenon and krypton. Those, those gas atoms then, um, uh, they sometimes form, they form some small bubbles within the grains, but principally um, the, they uh, diffuse to grain boundaries. Um, the bubbles form on the grain boundaries and then grow and interconnect. So you can kind of see the progress of that process in a UO2 fuel pellet here. Um, so eventually, those uh, as those uh, grain boundary bubbles grow and interconnect, they can uh, uh, form a fully connected pathway to a free surface, and then that leads to, uh, to release of these gases to the, um, the the gap between the fuel and the cladding. So when that happens, it increases the strain in the cladding, and it also decreases the thermal conductivity of the fuel, which which can have um, uh, basically raises temperature and um, puts us closer to an, an accident type scenario. So um, 
as I said, UO2 is the principal uh, fuel uh, that's been used in most commercial reactors, but there's been a lot of interest recently in using uranium silicide as an alternative. So um, relative to UO2, it does have a lower melting temperature, uh, but its thermal conductivity is, is also significantly greater. So that can uh, give it a higher margin to um, melting in the event of an accident type scenario. So um, uh, U3SI2 fuel, um, it's been used in research reactors in the past, um, but uh, at a, in a commercial reactor where it'd be operating at a higher temperature, the evidence that's out there suggests that it, the microstructure would be very similar to what's happened, uh, to what's seen in, in UO2, that fission, fission gas bubble growth, interconnection and release. And so um, some colleagues a few years ago developed a, a model in Bison based on, based on those assumptions. So, um, uh, again, the problem being uh, with these new types of fuel, we don't have a lot of data to to um, to inform them. So, um, we uh, in as part of the NEMS program, we we um, used lower link scale calculations to try to reduce the uncertainty uh, of this model that was developed uh, within Bison. So, uh, as part of that work, they did a sensitivity analysis to look at. Um, the effect of the parameters in the model and which ones have had the biggest effect on um, uh, the model predictions and, and did kind of a sensitivity analysis based on that. So, so starting out looking at um, the, the, the bubble uh, dihedral angle and the bubble uh, gas, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the surface energy between the bubble and the fuel, those were a couple of the most important parameters. So uh, my uh, former colleague, uh, Ben Beeler, uh, developed an interatomic potential for U3SI2 and um, used that to calculate um, the dihedral angle based on the surface energy and grain boundary energies, uh, which can be calculated from these MD uh, simulations such as shown here. Um, and then so he was able to pass that into um, uh, bison, but we also needed to know another parameter in the model, which actually was 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 even more important, which um, this uh, saturation coverage of grain faces. And so, what that parameter is is um, if we if we have a a certain fractional coverage um, of the grain boundaries basically above that saturation value, essentially the model the bison model assumes that all of the gas bubbles become interconnected and the gas can then be released into the, the fuel cladding gap. So they didn't really have a, a measured value available, so they were using a, a theoretical estimate, which is just basically, you know, how many circles can you pack into a, a square, right? Or, you know, what's the, the so it's basically pi over four. But, um, you know, the reality is the microstructure is much more uh, complex. So we wanted to use phase field simulations to, to try to uh, determine that value and inform the bison model. So uh, to do that, um, uh, we're using a, a, a phase field model. And so, um, uh, you know, I know not everyone in here is, is a phase field modeler as well. So I'll try to say a little bit more about how we represent um, the microstructure of the fuel within uh, the phase field context. So what we do is we have a, a, a so-called order parameter that represents what phase the um, material is in at each position. So say for grain one, we have an order parameter A to one, and that has a value of one inside that grain. Uh, we have another grain of the fuel, um, uh, call that grain two, which has an order parameter associated with it of A to two. And then the grain boundary is represented by a diffuse variation between those order parameters uh, across the interface. And then we have another order parameter for the bubble phase. Um, and again, we have a, a smooth variation of that order parameter uh, from the bubble into one of the grains. Um, and so uh, this uh, so-called diffuse interface approach usually has uh, features um, grain boundaries that are much wider than the actual physical width of an interface for, for computational uh, efficiency, reasons of computational efficiency. So that's the basic uh, idea. Um, for this particular uh, flavor of phase field model, we also track the local um, the local uh, defect concentrations in the form of uh, the local vacancies and uh, fission product species. So, um, principally, uh, xenon is uh, xenon is the most prevalent of those fission product species. There is some krypton in there, but we basically have assumed that we can represent the physical properties well enough with xenon. So, we have source terms for the production of those defect species. 
and then um, we also need to get the to get the geometry of these bubbles right. We need to set the surface energy and the grain boundary energy uh, because those two, the balance of those two, controls the the dihedral angle, which was uh, shown to be a, a, a an important parameter in uh, the Bison model. So in order to uh, parameterize this model, it would be nice if we could remove the, the bulk energy contribution to the uh, interface, interfacial energy between those phases. So to do that, we're using, uh, for, for this work and for several, several of the other projects that I'll, I'll describe, uh, we're using a, a model that we developed a few years ago um, based on a, a grand potential functional. So um, historically, most phase field models have been based on a, a functional of uh, the Helmholtz or the Gibbs free energy. So uh, uh, Matisse Plapp showed a few years ago that there are some uh, advantages to uh, using a, the grand potential as your, um, as your thermodynamic variable. Um, and so we developed a multi-phase, multi-order parameter extension to uh, the, the, the grand potential approach. And so a couple of nice advantages of this model are that it removes the bulk free energy contribution from the interfacial energy. And so that allows us to set the interfacial thickness and, and interfacial energy um, independently. And uh, that allows us to use a coarser mesh. And so that gives us improved uh, computational performance. So removing the, the bulk energy contribution from the interfacial energy is, is similar to the, the Kim Kim Suzuki or KKS face field model, uh, which some uh, face field model folks uh, are probably familiar with. But uh, we don't, in, unlike KKS, we don't need separate phase concentration variables, um, which, which gives us improved computational performance. And then another nice advantage of this formulation is that it prevents the spurious formation of additional phases at, um, at the interface between two, uh, two existing phases, which is something that's kind of plagued a lot of um, multi-phase models in the past. So, um, from that grand potential function, we derive our evolution equations. So we have, uh, for the order parameters, we have an Allen Kahn, uh, we have an Allen Kahn evolution equation, and then in the grand potential formulation, um, rather than evolving uh, concentration or density, we actually change to an evolution equation for the chemical potential, uh, and so that's what's shown here is the um, the chemical potential evolution equations. We have diffusivities that are informed uh, by atomistic calculations. And then we have these source terms that represent uh, the, the production and net production of defects. So one other parameter that we need uh, to set up our simulations is the initial uh, density of bubbles. Um, uh, so, so phase field in general uh, does not, uh, phase field in general uh, does not say much about nucleation. So in, in this case, we, we started out with a, a, a bubble density that we took from rate theory simulations that were done uh, by colleagues at Argonne National Lab. So with their help, we were able to kind of con uh, convert their, their, their um, rate theory models um, to um, an initial bubble number density along the grain boundaries. And that lets us set up our initial conditions. Hopefully this movie will, um, okay, it actually plays pretty well over, uh, over Zoom, which is nice. So uh, we set up our initial conditions. Um, uh, with representative temperature, uh, we set the dihedral angle based on the atomistic calculations. Um, the grain boundary, uh, it's, I think the, the size of the grain boundary is representative of what you'd see uh, in um, E3SI2 fuel, and we set the initial number density, as I said, based on those rate theory calculations. Um, okay, this was just my backup in case those movies didn't play, but I think you saw that reasonably well. Um, so now then, to take this information and get something that we need for bison, um, we kind of need to analyze the data in, in a, kind of a different, uh, different way rather than just looking at the bubble density or the aerial coverage versus time. Uh, what we did is, is plot the, the fraction of bubbles that are vented to the edge of the simulation domain uh, on the y-axis versus the grain boundary coverage. And so this is sort of uh, in a... a it's, it's kind of an assumption in the bison model that um, you would you would have like a, a the fractional coverage would grow and then all of a sudden it would spike up and, and like I said previously they were using a value of pi over four basically so that's kind of what's shown here. So what we did was um, 
plotted the grain the, the the vented fraction versus the the fractional coverage and you see that it doesn't it's not like a sharp spike like what you'd see um but it does it does increase rather rapidly at at, at some point so so in the short term what we've done basically is figure out where is the um where's the slope of this curve greatest and said okay well let's let's use that for our fractional coverage at, at saturation and in this case it was 0.62 which is quite a bit less than that 0.78 value they were using longer term what we'd like to do is, is to account for this more gradual release uh within bison um following this this curve shape that we've determined from our phase field simulations um <clears throat> but for the time being uh there's still a lot we can do uh that's useful with with this single value so we ran uh, uh you know several different initial conditions um kind of tried to figure out an, an average and and i know this is not a tremendous number of, of uh this is not a tremendous amount of data from which to derive a, a standard deviation but it does give us at least some sense of what's what's the um What's the uncertainty in this value that we're calculating? And, and you know, it's 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 relatively insensitive to the initial bubble configuration. So so that's good. I think that gives us some confidence in in the value that we're using. Another thing that we looked at, there were several other factors that we looked at. I think one of the more interesting ones is the effect of the simulation domain geometry. So. Um, you know this this kind of square shape for a grain boundary is is not really representative of the number of of edges of of a typical grain boundary. So we said, okay, well, what's you know what's the kind of other extreme to that would be a, a circular grain boundary, right? And and so you know a different ratio of area to to perimeter, kind of uh, two extremes. Um, and we see that actually the the uh, the release fraction is is actually very similar, or I'm I'm sorry, the, the progress of of uh, venting is very similar uh, for those two different um, geometries, simulation domain geometries. So so that that uh, grain boundary geometry we don't think has a really significant effect. So that kind of gives us more confidence to use these values, and then ultimately. Um, you know what we're trying to get to here is is uh, getting something that's useful for for bison. So um, we uh, were able to pass these uh, pass this data to our colleagues that run bison, and um, they ran some simulations using bison of um, the uh, uh, irradiation uh, of uh, some U three Si two rodlets in the advanced test reactor at INL. Uh, the experimental uh, the experiment numbers are shown here. And um, we uh, saw that uh, the uh, experimental fission gas release was was within the range of bison predictions given these uncer un uncertainties. And um, one thing I wanted to highlight uh, in particular from this is that um, we uh, were able to uh, reduce the uncertainty. So this was this was done. Uh, this uncertainty um, or sensitivity analysis was done um, prior to uh, our mesoscale work. And so you see that this was one of the greatest sources um, of uncertainty in the model. Now, with the caveat that this is a different, uh, this was actually a, a different set of bison simulations. We do see though that now, if you look at um, the, the, the relative um, contribution to uncertainty from this, this parameter, now that we've been able to, to kind of narrow this parameter down, we went uh, minus two sigma and two sigma above the, the mean value that we found. Now, actually we've been able to um, reduce the uncertainty associated with um, uh, that particular parameter quite a bit. And uh, actually much to the happiness of our, our bison colleagues, the, the numerical performance of the model was, was really significantly improved when we do this as well, uh, because um, some of these large saturation values led to very high swelling because the gas is kind of building up inside the fuel way more than is physical, uh, leads to a lot of swelling, a lot of um, contact with the cladding and deformation of the cladding that really wasn't physical. So by kind of eliminating that range of those parameters, we were able to improve the model of uh, improve the model performance quite a bit. So, just to kind of give some uh, kind of broad conclusions from this section of the work, um, you know, we use um, atomistic and mesoscale methods uh, together to show um, uh, to, to to inform a bison model of. Um, uh, uh, performance of U3SI2 fuel. So this is a fuel where data wasn't uh, 
data wasn't really available. And so we were able to get uh, get this data without needing to wait for, for very costly and, and time-consuming post-irradiation examination. Um, from the face field work, um, I, we looked at a couple different effects that I, I didn't, uh, didn't quite have time to show, but um, we looked at um, the effect on the fractional coverage of saturation from things like the domain geometry, which I did show, we also, we also looked at uh, temperature effect, bubble spacing, and so forth, and found that we didn't have a strong effect on that value, fractional coverage at saturation. Then we were able to use that value in bison simulations and show uh, significantly reduced uncertainty in, in fission gas release predictions. So um, that's... Uh, that's kind of the nuclear fuel part, portion of uh, the work that I wanted to talk about. We have a couple other uh, topics that we're working on in our group. So this is one that we've um, uh, been uh, spending some time on uh, that's that's not uh, not necessarily directly related to nuclear fuel is, is, is maybe a little bit broader topic and that's on um, electric field assisted sintering. So uh, traditional sintering is a technique for powder consolidation where uh, you, you take a, a powder uh, and um, expose it to high temperature for long periods of time and, and eventually uh, that reduces the, the, the porosity. Um, so electric field assisted sintering uh, generally adds um, heat and pressure to the mix. And so uh, as we do that, um, we, can, we can consolidate powders, both metal and ceramic, um, with quite a, uh, quite a lot lower uh, energy input compared with traditional sintering or even compared with hot pressing where, where you would apply uh, pressure and temperature at the same time. So, um, you know, as I said, this, is, uh, uh, this could be uh, uh, applied to nuclear, uh, nuclear fuel, but I think it's, it's also quite a bit broader. So, so in nuclear fuel, um, UO2 fuel is, is made by this traditional sintering process, and they do have to hold it for very long, uh, very long times at high temperatures in order to get uh, the porosity of these UO2 pellets that are used uh, down to uh, low enough values that they can be used um, in uh, the fuel rodlets. So certainly, um, uh, this um, that's one uh, potential application for electric field assisted sintering, but we have. Um, many other applications in mind. So things like moderators and um, reflectors, other components within the nuclear reactors, uh, heat exchangers, um, hydrogen production. These are all things that um, can could uh, be used, uh, th that electric field assisted sintering could be used for. So um, INL is, is, for these reasons, INL is investing heavily both in, in experimental and modeling and simulation capabilities. So um, we have this, this very large system, the DCS-800, which is actually capable of doing electric field as assisted sintering on a, 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 a sample that's up to like a half a meter wide. It's, it's actually pretty crazy how large it is. Um, uh, we also have some capabilities to look at um, electric field assisted sintering or EFAS in, in a radiological environment. So we have um, uh, uh, EFAS in this, uh, an EFAS system in this radiologically controlled glove box. So we're also investing in uh, modeling and simulation capabilities to understand um, EFAS. And so um, uh, we have, uh, as I, I mentioned, this, this application before Malamute, which is for modeling and simulation of advanced manufacturing. And so that's where some of the code that um, is applied to this um, technique lives. And so we're looking at uh, developing models for both engineering scale and um, mesoscale. And so for the mesoscale work, we're um, using the, the, the phase field method. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, I've done to, to develop a model for EFAS and then kind of how that links to the, the multi-scale work that we're, um, that we're eventually moving towards. So uh, again, uh, for folks that are not, uh, from, not from a phase field modeling background, we, we represent the microstructure uh, here in, in kind of a similar way uh, as we would with the, uh, the, nuclear, um, the nuclear fuel that I showed before. So we have, um, we have an order parameter representing each grain and, and the order parameter has a value of one in that grain and all the other parameters have a value of zero. Um, you know, grain two is something similar. 
and then we have uh, you know rather than uh, a, a, a rather than a um, a fission gas bubble here, we have a void, and we have an order parameter representing that void. Um, and so the test case, the test case material that we're using here is is yttria. Uh, it sorry. It has a defect structure that's that's relatively similar to to EO two, but doesn't present so many of the the challenges to work with experimentally. So that's kind of why uh, yttria is our, our test case. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just just to, uh, if if this wasn't clear before, hopefully this is um, makes it, makes things more clear with the, the 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 meaning of the diffuse interface. So in grain one, we have order parameter one has a value uh, of of one, and then in grain two order parameter two has a value of one, and then we have this diffuse variation of the two uh, through that interface. So in this model, we don't have fission gas, um, but we track, uh, we do track vacancies. We track vacancies in this case on both the cation and the anion lattices. Um, and we have, uh, we do assume a net charge for those vacancies, um, which we wanna account for due to the interaction with the electric field. So the void phase then is, is composed entirely of those vacancies. Um, again, we're using this grand potential based model that I described before. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the, the model formulation is, is very much the same, except that we have an additional term to account for the interaction between the material and the uh, electric field. So again, we, we, we get allen kahn equations for the uh, order parameters, and then we, uh, for the vacancy evolution equations, we have um, uh, chemical potentials. Uh, we didn't really have uh, diffusivities. Uh, we didn't have experimentally measured values for, for diffusivities, but uh, we'll make an assumption that they're uh, higher at grain boundaries uh, by a factor of 10 to the 6 and at surfaces by 10 to the 9. And then um, we also solve the, um, uh, the electric potential concurrently with the evolution equation. So we, we, um, we sort of, we split the, uh, we split the uh, electric potential into the equilibrium potential, uh, which derives from um, the grand potential functional and uh, the homogeneous uh, solution, uh, which is due to um, deviation of that potential due to an applied electric field. And then, um, uh, we then uh, calculate the uh, electrical conductivity based on uh, the defect densities and diffusivities. And then uh, joule heating then is, is based on the, that um, uh, homogeneous uh, field uh, magnitude and uh, in the, in the uh, electrical conductivity. So um, one of the things that we wanted to try to capture in our model is, is defect segregation and, and to try to understand what effect that would have um, on the charge uh, at grain boundaries. And so um, if you look, uh, again, this is just kind of a picture of the order parameters that I showed before, and we have a grain boundary at the center of this domain. Um, we assume that there's a lower formation energy for vacancies at the grain boundaries, and so that's going to result in, in an elevated concentration of these vacancies. And because these vacancies are charged, that's going to lead to um, imbalance um, of charge and an electric potential gradient. So that's what you see here. You see the, the, the um, defect densities for, for vacancies and, and oxygen um, vacancies and uh, the resulting electric potential that forms. Um, we did some work to try to understand um, the, uh, the growth of necks between two uh, two particles. Uh, I didn't have time to, to go into the details on that. Um, so I wanted to just kind of skip right to the, um, the many particle simulations that we've been working on. So this just kind of shows an evolution. So you see rapid net growth at the beginning, which kind of slows down. And then um, as the, um, uh, as the necks begin to grow, um, you start to see then uh, some, some grain growth concurrently as well, as well as some uh, porosity evolution. So we were interested in kind of looking at the, um, what is the um, electric field look like uh, and what does the resulting uh, heat uh, generation look like? So um, this shows that, um, uh, shows the grain structure here. Uh, and I plotted the, um, the electrical conductivity on a log scale here. Otherwise, it's, it's pretty hard to see the, the grain boundary contributions. 
So if you look at the resulting heat generation from Joule heating, you see that um, you know, due to the high concentration of, of defects and the high uh, diffusivity of those defects on the surfaces, there's, there's quite a high uh, heat generation rate at the surfaces, but there's also quite a, a, a high um, generation of um, a high generation of uh, heat within the grain structure itself. So we wanted to try to understand that better. So we kind of looked a little bit at this uh, zoomed in region at the center here. So focusing on one particular grain boundary here, uh, highlighted with this yellow circle, um, hopefully you can see there's kind of a pop of yellow here at that grain boundary, which represents an enhanced uh, electrical conductivity at the grain boundary. Um, still quite a lot lower than the surrounding surfaces. But then if you look at the if you look at the local heat generation, you see that it's predominantly locate, located at these grain boundaries rather than the surfaces. So this was a little counterintuitive, at least to me at first, because the the the, the connectivities are much higher at the surfaces, but the um, the heat generation is is predominantly happening at the grain boundary. So to try to understand that, I also plotted out uh, this, uh, the magnitude of the electric field here. So um, this is the magnitude of that uh, applied field. And so if you look at the, um, so you know, equal to the electric field, if you look at that, those potential drops are actually really predominantly um, localized at the grain boundaries. And so if you look at the equation for joule heating, you see that you have uh, it's it's linearly proportional to the conductivity, but it's but it's proportional to the the, the electric field squared. So, so even though the the, the uh, conductivity is lower at the grain boundaries, the electric potential drop is higher, and so the the drop and the the the, the potential actually is what dominates. Um, so experimentally, we expect that the the area of, of any surfaces is is going to be uh, pretty small compared to all of the internal areas. You know, especially if you're looking at a half meter compact, right? So, so really it's the generation of heat within these grain boundaries that's going to dominate. Um, and so uh, just to uh, kind of describe where we're going with this, um, you know, we're kind of trying to move towards a multi-scale approach like I sh uh, showed for the nuclear fuel. Um, here we're, we've, we've actually uh, set up some simulations within the Malamute repository uh, where we do concurrent multi-scaling. So we have an engineering scale model of, of a, um, of a chunk of material, we pass uh, we pass uh, particular um, parameters, uh, field variables such as the um, temperature, electric potential, and so on to uh, individual uh, individual um, phase phase field simulations, and then from those simulations, we can calculate things like the effective uh, an, an effective thermal conductivity and electric uh, effective elect electrical resistivity, and pass that back. To the um, to the engineering scale model, so we have that set up. It's really kind of just a proof of concept at this point, um, but that's kind of the direction that we're going in for um, uh, electric field assisted sintering. So just to kind of sum up the work there, um, I'll kind of just go through this quickly. So I have a little time to talk about my last topic, but um, basically we've uh, developed a model of electric field assisted sintering. Uh, accounts for the grain structure, the defect species, and the electric field. And um, we've applied that. As I said, we've done some work on net growth, which I didn't have quite have time to go into, but um, also looked at multi-particle configurations and um, saw that the, the, the local, locally the, the heating is, is localized to, um, to the grain boundaries. Uh, eventually, uh, we're also working uh, on incorporating plastic flow effects. So um, we have a collaboration with Professor Edwin Garcia from Purdue, and he's he's been working with us on the, the plastic flow effects. And we're kind of in the next year working on, on kind of merging those two models and also strengthening the connection with the, the engineering scale model. OK, so uh, the last topic, uh, which I'll tr kind of try to go through quickly here, is, is on uh, radiation driven um, defect uh, super lattice formation in uh, metals and alloys. Um, so uh, what I mean by super lattices is an ordered array of defects, either voids or gas bubbles, depending on how we irradiate them. Um, and so the uh, uh, void super lattices um, uh, have a, a the, the, the diameter of the voids is usually something like five to 20 nanometers. And then the, 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 the spacing between those is, is something like 20 to 80 nanometers. 
gas bubble super lattices tend to be a little bit smaller, two to four nanometer diameter and, and something like five to 10 uh, nanometer super lattice spacing. The super lattice usually has the same structure uh, as the materials crystal structure. So a BCC uh, uh, solid is gonna have a BCC super lattice. Uh, the, the, the notable exception, which, which uh, I don't think we really understand yet, is, is that uh, BCC U-Mali actually has an FCC uh, super lattice. So that's, that's still to be figured out, but, but generally uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the same crystal structure. The, the crystal structure and the super lattice structure are the same. So there's been a lot of hypotheses in the past on the formation mechanisms, why these form. So things like dislocation cavity interaction, Turing instabilities, um, anisotropy of elastic properties is, is one that's been studied a lot, as well as uh, diffusivities, anisotropic diffusivities of, of interstitials. So this is a problem, uh, I think, that has got kind of both practical and fundamental um, uh, reasons to be interested in from both a, a practical and a fundamental standpoint. From a practical standpoint, this is actually very nice for, for fission gas retention because uh, these super lattices, you know, they don't connect up in the same way that grain boundary bubbles, right? Uh, grain boundary bubbles do. So you can actually store a lot more fission gas before you would release. Um, but from kind of a more fundamental and broader standpoint, you know, maybe this is something that can be used to kind of tune or even control transport pop properties of materials. So, you know, things like a photonic, photonic crystals have been made that have a, a larger structure than this, but could we make, uh, use this approach to make a material that might have like a, a photonic band gap or, or plas plasmonic effects on uh, plasmonic, um, plasmonic, correlations between correlated electron transport of correlated electrons. Um, so uh, one of the first things we did um, on this project was kind of uh, figure out what we thought the most likely mechanisms were and um, uh, for this formation. And so we've really focused on elastic anisotropy and diffusion anisotropy. So we studied this first with um, uh, a con Hilliard type model. Um, where uh, we basically are only looking at uh, vacancies uh, and void super lattice formation. Um, and so we, we then uh, couple that with uh, uh, diffusion type equations for um, self interstitial atoms. Uh, and the model also has production uh, and recombination terms. And so to look at, um, uh, to look at the effects of anisotropic uh, diffusivity of these interstitials, we looked at BCC materials and FCC materials. And so with these, um, uh, with these individual crystal structures, we kind of looked at um, uh, how many different uh, unique directions are there for, for diffusivity along these um, uh, particular directions. And we introduced basically one species that has that uh, enhanced diffusivity in that direction. Um, and so, uh, you know, four different types in, in BCC, six different types in FCC. And, um, whether we did this uh, by whether the super lattice is formed by spinel decomposition or nucleation, we saw that the simulated microstructures always match the underlying crystal structure. So that's good. That matches experiment in most cases. Um, then we also looked at uh, anisotropy of the elastic constants. So we incorporated that in the model using a, um, a, 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 a an eigenstrain that's dependent on the local defect concentration. And um, we varied the, um, uh, the Zener anisotropy ratio, which is basically uh, a kind of a metric for how, uh, how, the, how anisotropic it is. Um, and so what we saw when we varied that anisotropy ratio, uh, so that's what the, if you're interested in the, the Zener anisotropy ratio is here. Um, and so if, if that was lower than one, then we, we obtained an, an FCC uh, an FCC structure. So that's an example here. Um, a value greater than one, we actually got a simple cubic structure. And a value of one, basically, there was never really a super lattice uh, that formed. So uh, the thing with this is uh, we, the, the experimentally, the, the, the simulations in this case are not consistent with the experimentally observed microstructures. Um, and then another fact that I, I think is important here is that um, it has been observed that in tungsten, uh, which has a Zener anisotropy ratio of, of, of one, you still form BCC, BCC super lattices. So 
A lot of the um, evidence that we see from this work points to diffusion anisotropy as, as kind of the main uh, mechanism for how um, these super lattices form. Um, I'm getting a little short on time here, so I won't say too much about, um, about this part of the work, but what we did was uh, going then from uh, the void super lattice formation to gas bubble super lattice. Um, we developed a, a, a unified model that could kind of handle both of those uh, types of super lattice. Um, and we, um, again, using this grand potential functional approach, um, we incorporated uh, vacancies, different types of interstitials that diffuse in different ways, and then um, uh, also gas atoms as well. Uh, and then again, accounted for the different types of uh, recombination and sync, sync, sync absorption that can happen. So this model can act, actually capture spinal decomposition uh, or nucleation type mechanisms, but based on experimental observations, we think nucleation is more likely. So um, we're using an approach for nucleation here that's, that's uh, very similar to what uh, Katsuya's former student, Andrea, used um, where uh, you basically uh, modify the non-conserved order parameter and there's uh, a, a, a rush of vacancies in to the nucleus to stabilize it. In this case, we, we changed, changed the approach slightly so that we actually just add a forcing function uh, to the evolution equation, uh, but similar idea that we hold it long enough for the vacancies to stabilize it and then we turn this forcing, forcing function off. Um, we looked a little bit then at some of the effects of these parameter choices on the super lattice morphology. So um, the uh, we characterized this with a two-point correlation function approach. So um, we developed some, some relationships between uh, the super lattice spacing and um, the nucleation, or I'm sorry, the, 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 the model parameters and the um, uh, observed microstructures. And, and so in, in most cases, we were consistent with the experimental observations. Um, uh, the one thing that we didn't quite get right was um, uh, as we increased the gas, uh, the uh, gas to vacancy ratio, um, we predicted the opposite trend as seen in experiments. And this was because we um, weren't accounting for the fact that when, when um, gases and vacancies uh, are, are present in, in appreciable concentrations, they like to bind together, which actually decreases the diffusivity of the clusters quite a bit. And so just kind of uh, last, um, uh, last topic on this project, uh, and I think pretty, I think this is, I'm not involved with this as much, so I can say I think this is a really cool result and a really cool idea. This was done by uh, my for former colleague, Cheng Sun, who's a professor at Clemson University now. So he read in the literature that, um, uh, okay, so starting out, uh, this is in tungsten where BCC super lattices form, even though it's elastic, elastically isotropic. And so there was some previous work that had been done that showed that as you add rhenium to tungsten, it causes a transition from 1D uh, diffusion of the interstitials to, to 3D. Uh, diffusion of, of mixed dumbbells. And so he actually uh, designed an experiment just to um, add rhenium uh, to, uh, to vary, uh, in varying concentrations to these um, samples. And he found that indeed, as, as he um, increased the rhenium concentration, um, we had, saw a transition from, from order to disorder. And so, you know, the amount uh, of, of helium that was needed to do that was, was somewhat uh, varying depending on, on the sample, but I think this is, this is uh, the best evidence to date that, that the 1D diffusion of self-interstitial atoms is, is really the primary driver of, of the formation of these gas bubble super lattices. So um, uh, that's the end of my talk. I just wanted to thank everyone for, for your attention. I want to thank my, my group members that are shown here, um, uh, as well as uh, the funding agencies, the DOE and e NEMS program, INL LDRD program, and uh, basic energy sciences and uh, material science and engineering division. So thanks very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. We have a roaming mic if there's questions. So if there's any questions. Get back. Um, sure, I have a question about the uh, void percolation at grain boundaries thing. Do you consider elastic effects for that? Um, I actually did in the first round of that work. Mm -hmm. 
and um, it added a lot of computational expense. And so I asked, is this really an important effect to consider? So I ran simulations with and without, and it actually didn't affect the results significantly. Okay. So I kind of turned it off. Yeah, yeah. For for a couple of these, I'm kind of wondering if there's if if you applied sort of a macro scale strain as a boundary condition, if it would affect the the evolution somehow. But uh, for that one and for for really all of them. Seems like at the macro scale, you could have something applied that would affect it, but it's hard to know what that would be. <laughs> yeah. So, so a lot of, I mean, the effect I was looking at was mostly like the overpressurization or underpressurization mm -hmm. of the gas bubbles. Yeah. Exactly, so yeah. the balance between the gas bubble pressure and the surface tension, um, mm -hmm. you know, with that, uh, that would induce a local strain in the surrounding matrix. Yeah. So, um, I found it didn't have a, a particularly big effect. I did not look at um, like macro scale strain effects though. So and that, and those, that, I mean, that's a good question because that can actually, that will happen as the pellet, as the pellets swell and come into contact with the clad and intruder. Uh, they go into it. Yeah, yeah, you, you referenced that at the, the bison scale. Anyway, thank you. This is all excellent. It's very cool to see. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Beck. Very thanks for a great talk. So what, what one question about the super lattice. Uh, so what's their effect for their mechanical performance or like a toughness or ductility or strength? Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I we have not studied that too much in our program, um, but I mean I think that you know that's another I think reason why we kind of tried to. Think of broader applications because you know this is so it, it, the um, you know the mechanical strength um, well so so I mean the the potential application would be like lightweighting right so I mean like you can develop these uh, you can develop uh, this structure that reduces the density a lot without uh, without introducing the large um, large interconnected structures that might be might have a negative impact on the uh, on the overall mechanical property. So I guess my, my I guess my intuition is that it should be a good way to get a lighter material that's str stronger, but we haven't really we don't I don't have data to <laughs> kind of support that. Thanks for the talk. Um, this is more of like an administrative question, I guess. Um, like working at working at a national lab, um, where do you, I don't know, like where do you find yourself like being inspired by research questions? Like, is it, are they mostly things that your um, colleagues like have very specific problems they want you to investigate or do you get to kind of go off on your own? I'd imagine it's probably some combination of this it, you know it's a mix on different projects so like the NEMS program that I started out talking uh, out uh, talking about is is very um it's very industry driven so like the NEMS program has an industry council and the industry council says you know we're really interested in this and then you know our program leadership kind of tries to get us to suggest work that will uh, address those questions. I mean, they don't, they don't usually tell us like you need to work on exactly this, but it's kind of like, this is what sponsors are interested in. So you should try to figure out stuff that they're going to care about. Mm -hmm. um, but so that's like kind of a more applied program. I would say like the latter two parts of the talk are a little more like driven by us as researchers. So the middle section of the talk on electric field assisted centering, that's kind of a lab priority, but the, the, the funding was actually from the, um, lab directed research and development program. So that's a program where individual researchers can propose ideas or, or, you know, it's usually a team. We kind of propose ideas together and the lab reviews them, sees what they find most interesting and awards okay. funding. And then uh, I would say the, the last part of the talk is, is kind of the most um, maybe blue sky or, you know, kind of uh, individual researcher creativity type of, of question. So that's work that's funded by basic energy sciences. I mean, they fund a lot of university work as well, uh, as, as well as some, some lab work. So that's more like 
you have an idea and you need to kind of um, sell a program manager on the idea in order to get funding to, to perform it. And then the, then you write a proposal, the proposal is reviewed. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a range um, and different labs probably have different spectra of, you know, how their research ideas are developed, but that's kind of how, that's my experience at least. I have a question on that. Um, actually, two topics, both um, about dimensionality. Were you showing the, uh, first of all, excellent talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, the Were you showing a cross-section of the 3D simulation? Or that's what you were showing? Um, are you talking about so the- Void lattice and the uh, uh, seed drain. Yeah, Is so- the cross-section? Like... Yeah, so these are like the external uh, surfaces of a 3D simulation. But but the your simulation, the, the next page. Oh yeah, these are 2D simulations. 2D simulation. Yeah, right? so this was just kind of, we did 2D uh, just because the nucleation part is more expensive. And so we just, we're kind of trying to get trends on nucleation. I so see. We, we kind of felt like 2D was, was so, good enough. So you, you can't examine the transition between like B BCC versus FCC that you know. About. No, not not in not with the two D, not with the two D. So in this case, we just have we have uh, you know fast diffuse one interstitial species diffuses quickly in the X direction, and the other diffuses quickly in the Y okay. direction. So yeah, so so this is like I said, this was more just to understand the trends on nucleation and what that does to spacing. Can can you like once you understand, you know, the trend? Can you? Is 3D simulation possible? Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, I should say I, I don't know that for sure, but my uh, I would say yes. I mean, like you know, the the nucleation does slow things down a lot. And one thing we did not do was was like decide at some point, okay, we need to turn we we should turn nucleation off because we have a stable structure already. I think that would be reasonable to do at some point, and then that would speed things mm -hmm. up considerably afterwards. But we just had not um, didn't quite get didn't quite get that I far. See. The um kind of similar question was the um uh sintering. Mm, okay. You are seeing those uh, uh high uh delta V, you know, uh high resistive high resistivity grain boundaries, right? Mm. Was was that 2D or 3D? That was 2D. That yeah. was 2D. So so the I wonder if the connectivity, you know, to change the connectivity will basically change the elect, you know, electric. Conductivity yeah. path that might this might potentially disappear. Yeah, that's a good that's a that's a really good point. I mean, we need to do three D for this for sure, anyways, because um, the thing that we don't the thing that we don't capture right with just two D is um, we don't have like these internal pores mm -hmm. are not right. connected to right. this external surface through a, a surface pathway as they would be in 3D with at the early stages at least. So yeah, that's uh, that's definitely something we are planning on doing is, is moving this in 3D. But that is a good point about the grain boundary. Uh, I think maybe that's a good idea to try to consider that in 3D before we make the conclusion on grain boundary versus surface hotspots in, in 2D versus 3D. Thank you. I think Ahmed had a question. Thank you for your talk. Uh, early on in your talk, you had a slide that showed the new reactors that are being launched. Can you mm -hmm. go back to the slide? There's natrium and there's a whole bunch of other. Yeah, this one. So all of these are new technologies or is it the same light water reactor technology in different locations and sizes? Pretty much most of them are, let's see, I think they're all new technologies. I think um, this one, no, actually, okay. So I'm trying to see if there are any that are not. Okay, so this this is this is um, liquid metal cooled fast reactor um, using metallic fuel. Uh, I'm not sure about the whole tech. Um, this is actually, okay, so this is actually, I think the one and only one that would be a commercial a, a light water reactor, UO2 fuels or conium pellet. I think that's the only one. This is triso fuel. Uh, this, this may not happen, but this would be um, metallic fuel, liquid metal cooled. Um, Kairos is triso fuel. Um, Oklo is metallic fuel, liquid sodium. Uh, 
liquid sodium. This is actually molten salt. So um, BWX to Pele is, 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 so triso particles, I didn't talk about triso work at all. We have done some work in there. That's these um, small particles with uh, uranium carboxide fuel pellets surrounded by silicon carbide. So yeah, uh, pretty wide range of different um, fuel types that are actually moving towards implementation. This is all in the US? Yeah, yeah, you can see there's like the state that they're in is kind of oh. in the background here. <laughs> so here's there Idaho, a, here's Texas. Oh, here's, there was a clue, I missed it. Yeah, yeah, here's Wyoming. Wyoming doesn't have many clues about its shape, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this, I, uh, where is that? I'm not sure. Nancy. What state is that? New Jersey. New Jersey, thank you. That's oh. yes, Thank you. Anyway. Question with Aaron and then Liz, and then you have Thank you. So, um, also want to echo the it's really nice talk. Um, but so, my question is uh, regarding the um, centering model. Mm -hmm. Did you consider uh, particle translation and rotation? Like, I've seen some of the uh, face field models consider like an advection and, rota and rotation terms for that. And yeah. So, so yeah, we, we have not, and I, I don't know. I think there's, I think there's arguments to be made for how important that term is personally. Like I know some people feel like it's really important, but there has been work that has shown that if you include surface diffusivity, that basically like dominates everything. So, so the, those rigid body, mm -hmm. at least for the translation part, I'm not so sure about the rotation, but at least for the for the translation part, that relies on um, that relies on some assumptions about uh, the the grain boundaries being a sink, and so that really relies then on bulk diffusivity through um, uh, bulk diffusivity to to uh, uh, vacancies to those defects from like the surrounding. So yeah, this is. Maybe we can talk more about this. Yeah, we I'm haven't accounted for it. I yeah. think there's a lot of debate to be had on on how Hui Chao will tell you it's very important, but I'm not sure okay. I agree with that. <laughs> Thank you. This, uh, this was very fun, and thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, regarding the the void or bubble super lattices, um, is there a characteristic length scale that you get in a given material for the for the lattice parameter if you like or the super lattice parameter of these bubbles um i'm trying to remember uh it really depends it, i think it's actually i mean broadly uh it depends on what i think it depends more strongly on what it's irradiated with than the material itself. So those trends about like gas bubble super lattice spacing versus void spacing tend to tend to hold regard. Like a given material will have a much smaller um, spacing in a gas bubble super lattice. So radiation with uh, you know hel helium, krypton, xenon, that that spacing will be much smaller than void uh, formation where you'd irradiate with you know like self you know, self irradiation or you know iron some other. And what about temperature? And I'm asking this because it seems that if it is diffusion controlled, the spacing, this is not a lattice spacing, then this is a, a, a distance spacing. Mm -hmm. And so the spacing should scale with the diffusion coefficient. I mean, square root of square root DT, right? So, um, well, so, so think, do you see it? What do you see happening with temperature? What do you see happening? I mean, it makes sense then that the, that the vacancies are larger, you know, that the, the diffusion coefficient is much higher um, yeah. than, than, the, than the gas. So bubbles. I don't I don't think the experiments have shown much dependence on temperature. I think the diffusivity, uh, at least for the spacing, yeah. um, I think that the 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 the, the factor the, the the diffusivity part kind of controls um the the structure i so this is something i'm planning to work on more in the future but i think that the actually and, and this is actually something we showed in the in the in the the some of the results here is that the the nucleation rate the temperature effects on the nucleation rate i think are actually stronger than the effects on diffusivity that said i didn't include temperature diff, diff temperature dependent diffusivity and 
the simulation. So I should actually probably go back and do that. And then one more question, if I'm permitted, is, okay, so we've established this super lattice with some characteristic spacing. Mm -hmm. Now when we pump more gas or, or, or create, create more vacancies, do the bubbles just grow till they touch? They reach a kind of a saturation point and uh, the, the bubbles will grow. They usually, uh, they haven't generally been radiated out far enough that they would um, get to the point of, of touching, I guess. I mean, they go out to pretty high fluences, but usually once the spacing is set, it stays mm -hmm. at, a, at that value and then the bubbles will just grow. I don't think they've ever... I don't think it's ever been seen that they grow enough that they actually interconnect them. Yeah, interesting. Have you considered that both diffusivity and elastic and isotropy are relevant here? I think that is very possible. Um, but like I said, because of the example of tungsten, that's why I feel like the, um, the diffusivity and isotropy is, is the most important. I, I wouldn't rule out that both have an impact, but I don't think it will happen without Diffusivity and isotropy. Fair enough. And I think you all will take the last question because otherwise it feels like a thesis defense. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, for the gas bubble super lattice, I, I was wondering does the pressure condition of the bubble affect its formation? Because uh, there, there's some research suggests that different pressure condition of the bubble will affect its absorption um, interstitial and vacancies, like di different absorption density at different lattice directions, will that affect uh, the gas bubble lattice formation? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I think that that's a fair, I think that's, that would be worth looking into. Yeah, I mean, I think like, so you're saying that as you as you increase gas pressure, you're less likely to absorb interstitials. Yeah, overall, that's it. yeah, and, and also it will um, kind of um, the the strain field of the bubble will be kind of magnified, like by the internal pressure when mm -hmm. it interacts with different kinds of defects. So that could in, introduce some um, preferential diffusivity at certain directions. So I. It's just a rough thought, like yes. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I would think, yeah, the strain field. Well, if the bubbles are overpressurized, yeah. I mean, the strain field then is going to be compressive, and so that's going to be like a, actually a driving force for vacancy absorption and, and potentially grow the grow the bubbles more. I mean, um, yeah, I think that that's actually a great topic for future. Thank you. Thanks, you. All right, let's go ahead and thank our speaker and thanks for everybody for showing up. Thank you, everybody.